Michael Johnson is a Pittsburgh native, and uh, he's well known for his. Um, what was that? <laughs> for his awesomeness. awesomeness. He's well known for his his, his audiovisual tinkering, his um, his incredible sounds, and his um, what do you call it? Circuit bending based musical practice. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I'll just read the, read the little <laughs> blurb here. The intimate relations of microphones, pickups, coils, record cartridges, rump shakers, and homemade loudspeakers. This workshop will concentrate on the satisfying use and abuse of common and unusual devices for amplifying themes. From the humble telephone to the guitar pickup, contact mic, and radio receiver, we are constantly putting sound energy into little devices and taking it out again somewhere else, usually through loudspeakers. For anyone with even a passing interest in making their amplified things sound better, whether guitar strings, fish tanks, cacti, or empty rooms, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Michael Johnson. <laughs> which is uh, talk about uh, loudspeakers and microphones. Loudspeakers and microphones make a uh, sort of excellent uh, introduction to the world of uh, electronics and electronic uh, electronics and electronic music, uh, whatever that turns out to be, um, because uh, everything's got to come out of the box at one point or another. Uh, we don't really listen to electronics per se. Uh, we listen to air vibrating. Uh, the only thing that makes uh, the thing that electronic uh, sounds and acoustic sounds have in common is that they're all vibrations in the air. We have to set the air into vibration in order for us to hear electronics, uh, and it's the part of the uh, the chain in electronic music that's often most ignored. Um, so we got to get it out of the air and make it vibrate so that our ears hear it. It's no really any different from the vibrating membrane of a surface of a guitar or a drum or a wall or a refrigerator. Um, everything that we hear eventually has to make our ears vibrate. So I thought we could talk a little bit about this is sort of like borderline uh, science, basic science of uh, microphones and loudspeakers. Uh, some basic ideas about sound to sort of clarify some things that may or may, or may not be fuzzy. Uh, if it's boring to you, that's okay. Um, as well as to sort of introduce some uh, slightly unusual concepts of things that one can do with uh, loudspeakers and microphones that are a little bit unusual. <clears throat> Outside of um, getting the sounds into the air that are electronic in nature and making the air vibrate, we very often try to put sounds into our electrical boxes, and we do that with um, microphones of one type or another. Uh, the subject of mics and loudspeakers, uh, we'll say row phone, and uh, loudspeakers, the words themselves sort of contain their meaning as tends to be the case in uh, our language that tends to steal all its words from somewhere else. Um, so the word microphone can be divided into, the word loudspeaker can be divided into, well it can be divided in a lot more than two. But there are two sort of meaningful uh, roots to this word, micro and phone. So the word microphone means something like little sound or something like that, right? You're welcome to sort of shout out. <laughs> um, you say via every every time I do this. It's a code. You get a discount at the door. <laughs> Kick up your heels. Um, okay, so the word microphone somehow refers to small sounds, right? The uh, it's the job of the microphone to take tiny little uh, things and make them larger. Without microphones, most of uh, 
uh, sort of the interesting things about electronic sound would be virtually impossible. Without useful microphones, we wouldn't have any recorded music at all, because uh, we would have gotten really, except music that is generated entirely by electronic means. Any kind of sound we want to record from the natural world eventually has to pass through a microphone on its way into the box. So it's the job of microphones to sort of take little uh, sounds and turn them into what? You don't turn them into bigger sounds, right? The other end of the microphone doesn't have sound coming out, right? Here's a very typical microphone, and I point it at you, and it doesn't sound any louder on this end, right? What it puts out is something that goes through wires, and what it puts out is a small electrical signal, right? You guys sort of aware of that? And the electrical signal that a microphone puts out, we'll say, is like this big, really small. Okay, and then a loudspeaker, which uh, really tells its own story very clearly, is a loud speaker, which is to say it's like a, what do they call them in, is, it, is that Greek or Latin, stentor, somebody with a big voice, yeah. right? So the guy with the big voice would stand there with his arms cupped over his mouth and he would shout at the world, right? He was a loud speaker and it was his job to speak for other people if they were too quiet to speak for themselves. These days we have a tendency to use uh, electrical devices to do our loud speaking for us. Um, but that's basically the job of the loudspeaker to take uh, sounds and put them into the world. This is a, uh, a ripped up, uh, this is the basic ingredient of a loudspeaker, right? This is a loud, why don't we take the lid off of this? Where's my thing to take things with? All right, so if we look at the... Get, get, get. All right, so if we look at the business end of a loudspeaker, right, the sort of what's hidden behind the curtain, the Oz inside, um, we have these things which we call loudspeakers, right? And what that looks like is sort of a big fat cone whose job it is to push around the air. But what does it get on the other side? Does it get sound on the other side? No, it gets wire on the other side, right? Suspiciously similar to the wire that was coming out of this thing. So its job is to do sort of the same thing in reverse. It gets, uh, this pen's blue, okay. It gets uh, even better. It gets electricity or some kind of an electrical signal, a trick called signal, and it puts out sound, right? So we somehow have sort of completed a whole chain here. We've got sound international symbol for sound, right? It goes into the microphone and it turns into electricity and then somehow electricity energizes the loudspeaker. We feed the loudspeaker with energy and it makes... Okay, so, the general term for devices that change energy from one form to another is a transducer. What that means is that we're starting out with, uh, we'll call them vibrational energy, although that's not sort of a fancy term. We start with vibrations in the air or some kind of a flexible medium like water or uh, solid things like walls, right? We start out with vibrations, and what we're doing is turning them into electricity, right? Electricity, right? And then on the other end, we're starting with electricity and turning it back into vibrations, right? So a transducer is something whose job it is to take energy from one form and turn it into energy in another form. And we have those kinds of devices all over our measly little uh, technological world that do these sort of tasks for us all day long. Uh, things that, for instance, turn electrical energy into light energy, like light bulbs, that's a kind of a transducer. Its job is to convert energy from one form into another. Or things like uh, motors, whose job it is to free up the energy in chemicals like gasoline and turn them into rotational motion that makes our car move or uh, refrigerators whose job it is to use electricity and push heat somewhere else so that the things are cool in some little box, right? So these are all kinds of transducers. The word transducer is more uh, fancy Latin and it means to lead across. So it's the job of the transducer to lead energy from one form into another. And that's specifically what microphones and loudspeakers do in the realm of, uh, in the border between the realms of electrical energy and what we can call vibrational energy or acoustical energy. Does that make sense? Say no if it doesn't make sense. Say yes if it makes sense. Clap your hands. You can stop doing that. 
Um, other kinds of uh, transducers, maybe slightly more philosophical ones, or maybe not so philosophical. Uh, things like batteries, for instance, we store uh, electrical energy in chemical form and we sort of take it later. We really rely on this sort of stuff. Um, I would say maybe like the human body could be considered a kind of a transducer. You feed it uh, pork and wheat and uh, it turns into, or uh, you feed it Satan wings. <laughs> and uh, you, you turn that energy into um, uh, people blathering on about transducers. <laughs> So in the, uh, in the realm, we're really going to concentrate on the realm between electrical energy and acoustical energy, vibrations in the air, and electrical stuff, because that's what music's all about, or at least <laughs> electronic music. Um, and so that means that we're talking about microphones and loudspeakers. And there's a kind of a shocking symmetry to this whole thing, right? And we love symmetry because it makes us feel like the Earth is orderly. Right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, microphones we can consider to be sort of the membranes through which we hear the world, uh, or at least our electrical devices hear the world, right? Um, <coughs> and loudspeakers are the uh, sort of motors that push the air around so that they vibrate our ears. Does that make sense? A uh, microphone in many ways can be considered sort of an ear on a string, right? Just the way the camera can be considered sort of a... Um, an auxiliary eye or something like that. We always talk about how oh, the camera never blinks and crap like that, right? So you can put the camera in all kinds of unusual places. You can send it to the moon. You can point it into a microscope. You can send it into the human body and look at your uh, intestines or uh, go up your intestines and colonoscopy and stuff like that. Uh, we can do the same thing with microphones. The microphone is sort of an ear on a string and we can put that places to listen to things that would otherwise be difficult or hear in realms that it's difficult to hear in hear kinds of energy that are difficult to hear with our, uh, we don't call it, what do we call the unaided ear? We call it the naked ear. And we have to talk about the naked eye. This is a stupid expression too, isn't it? <laughs> um, but basically, uh, vibrating membranes, uh, vibrating electrical, uh, de uh, vibrating devices like this are really no different than any other vibrating object in the world, right? They tend to take a particular shape, they tend to look like loudspeakers, but the way they make you hear things is no different than um, pushing a cardboard box across the room, right? That generates a sound the same way that this thing generates a sound. It just happens to be fed electrically, but it's basically just a vibrating thing. And we kind of take that for, we kind of forget that, I think, very often when we lose, use loudspeakers, we think, think of them as these kind of perfect objects that are just going to reproduce uh, the world for us, and we don't think of them as an instrument, or that they're really not like a part of music or something like that, which is probably a big mistake. So, um, before we get too uh, excited about microphones themselves, I thought we could talk a little bit about sort of what are the limits of sound or what exactly is it that we experience as sound, because that's not necessarily all that clear, right? Oops, sorry. Um, so, sound is what? What exactly is it that we experience as sound that's sort of distinct from all the other experiences we have? Because we certainly know what visual things are. They're the things that strike our eyes and make us uh, we see colors and shapes and lines and motion and crap like that. But what exactly is it that we, uh, what exactly is it that happens when we hear a sound or how do we know that something's a sound as opposed to something else? Pitch, timbre. Huh? Pitch, timbre, rhythm. But what is the sound itself? Those are characteristics of the sound, but what is it that, what, what is it that defines the sound as separate from something else? Like what it really has to happen in order for us to say, I that's pitch. sound, that's not a, Vibrations uh, at a certain Satan frequency? Huh? Vibrations at a certain frequency? Well, they're vibrations, yeah, but they're vibrations of a particular kind, it's right? Pressure. Like, uh, we can vibrate all kinds of things, like we can vibrate a light on the wall. Or but I mean, like. but they're at a certain frequency range that is where our range of hearing is, right? Yeah, but there are visual vibrations, too, that we don't hear, right? Yeah, I know, but they go to, they're a lot faster. They're not mass vibrations. Pressure, they're, they're, they're right. There's something that somehow is causing the pressure within some kind of a medium to <coughs> vibrate, yeah. right? And that pre uh, the, the pressure within that medium has to vibrate in a way that eventually makes the bones in our head and the ears in our cochlea and all that stuff sort of wiggle, right? And send nerve impulses to our brain and somehow we're going to hear it, right? But if it doesn't get there through some kind of a vibratory path, it doesn't work. Um, the, different, the sound, though, doesn't uh, sort of there's a difference between a mass movement of air and a sort of a localized vibration in the air. Is that clear? Yeah. Like, uh, it's the, if somebody, um, if somebody uh, has a smelly burp on one side of the Bloomfield Bridge, 
and you might be able to smell it on the other side eventually, right? That's not sound, right? They have to actually set the air into vibration. It's not wind, right? Wind is a sort of a mass movement of the air. The air act just sort of locally vibrates the way that uh, water vibrates in a tub when you set it into vibration. You can see those waves, right? Well, I'll probably look at that in a minute, too. Um, so that's a sort of a major difference. Like, for instance, these are sounds. Um, this is not the uh, easiest. Uh, this oscilloscope is sort of ridiculously small. Can you guys actually see the screen of this thing? I couldn't bring a larger one today. But what we're showing here are uh, simultaneously what we're doing is generating very simple electrical signal, what we call a sine wave. We're feeding it to an amplifier, this big green box, which feeds this loudspeaker, which pushes the air around. And simultaneous to that, we're also sending that same electrical vibration to this thing, which looks at it. Right? It sort of gives us a visual representation of the sound. And I can reduce the frequency of this thing down to the point where it just sort of goes very slowly up and down. And if I turn it up, we can see it sort of massaging the air. Right? If we look at the loudspeaker here, we can sort of see it going whoosh, 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 right? And sort of trying to make the air move. And it is making the air move, and it is causing localized pressure changes in the air, just the way everything else does, but we're not actually hearing it as sound, right? Or are we? Can somebody actually hear that? Probably not. So as I gradually speed this thing, maybe somewhere around there you guys can probably start to hear it. Now this thing doesn't produce ba reproduce bass very well because it's a very tiny loudspeaker, but if you're careful, you, you guys can hear that, right? Maybe you in the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So there are, it's not just vibrations in the air that we hear or vibrations through some other sort of flexible medium like water or solids, um, but vibrations that, ha that sort of repeat within a certain range of repetitions, right? So there's a lower limit, a lower threshold below which we can't hear. Clearly nobody can hear this despite the fact that we're obviously being pelleted with pressure changes right now, right? That kind of but somewhere around there, we start to hear it as sound. And likewise, there's an upper limit. So somewhere up here, you probably can't. Can anybody hear this? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's painful. Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. Right there, it probably is. You guys can hear that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So there is a sort of an upper and a lower I'm limit. Still yeah, there. <laughs> Matter. Don't you like sound? Oh, okay. uh, there's an upper and a lower limit. We say that if a sound sort of repeat, uh, what we hear is sort of changes, right? So a sound has to repeat or at least uh, sort of cause a vibration in the air for, in order for us to hear it as sound. And it has to repeat somewhere between uh, 10, 20 times per second and on the upper limit somewhere like uh, 20,000 times per second in order for us to actually hear it as sound. Anything above or below that and it's stuff that we can't hear. Right? So what we can't hear, for instance, are these really low frequency stuffs way down here. Right? Uh, and we also can't hear things like batteries. We plug the battery into the amplifier. This is, this is a pretty fresh one. So let's listen to those. Woo! Okay, so what we see, if we look at the oscilloscope, actually the traces. Saturated no, it's DC code. There we go. Okay, so now when we listen to it, watch the battery go. Whomp. Okay, so I got these leads switched. So we see it goes from its zero spot down to go. What did I do? There we go. Okay, so it sort of jumps down, right? And we can watch the loudspeaker move too. It's a thrill. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that it, uh, I just, that's why it broke. Okay. So, we, uh, we're basically creating a very tiny puff of wind. Right? And I, what I do here is when I turn it on or off, right, so there's that sort of click, and if I do it very rapidly, I have a very primitive square wave generator. Right? Where I'm generating excursions above and below particular uh, big thrill, right? So what we can hear are changes, but we don't hear anything static. And that's a big difference, right? Because that's 
how we represent electrically sound is that we represent changes in a pressure, right? Uh, it's not just a pressure, like I can't hear pushing against a wall, but what I can hear is if I vibrate the wall. Right? I actually have to make it go in and out. That's a big difference. Um, so anything above, I should never put down a pen. Anything above 20,000 frames a second we call ultra sound, right? Because it's even more than sound. It's beyond sound, right? That's what ultra means. And anything below 20, 000, uh, 20 cycles per second we call infra sound, right? And so sound is sort of defined by the perceiver, right? Sound for people is somewhere between 20, 20 repetitions and 20,000 repetitions a second, but that varies from person to person. These guys in the front could hear the high-frequency stuff really well. Uh, most adults can't because they lose their high-frequency hearing pretty quickly. Um, but we know, of course, that there are a lot of animals that hear well outside of our ranges, uh, so it's sound for them, it's not sound for us, right? Um, and there's been a lot of work, especially in weapons world, in uh, the sounds that are sort of just at the border of our hearing, right? We know, for instance, that there are a lot of, there's a lot of use of sound and, excuse me, uh, to sort of hurt us badly right at the top range of our hearing. What we, uh, these days they just developed, what it, since we hosted the G20, they got yeah. to test out the LRAD devices yeah, on LRAD, us. LRAD, long range the acoustic long, device. Long range acoustic device, which is a sort of very high frequency, extremely powerful. Uh, noise cannon. Yeah, a kind of a noise cannon, right? So there's the LRAD. There's also uh, Jules Verne fantasized these things called Leiden balls, which was some kind of like a thing you whip it at somebody and then it sort of explodes and makes sound right at them locally. And then some weapons researcher decided to try to develop that kind of thing. Uh, and then on the low frequency end, we have a lot of weird research to try to make low frequency sound that actually hurts people. Do you guys know the legend of the brown sound? Right, that sort of thing actually does work with uh, reasonable uh, repeatability, but the problem with low frequency sound is that it's very hard to make directional. So uh, if you're going to uh, use it on your uh, enemy, you're probably using it on yourself at the same time. <laughs> the problem is to sort of get it somewhere else and not uh, uh, get it where you are. Right. What's that? Drop it from a plane. Drop it from a plane, right. Um, take the ball. I'll take, I'll take the Leiden ball. They're now making these things, the, ta the tasers and stuff, they're making these things called piezers, which are these kind of, uh, I just read about them recently, it's like a little exploding uh, electrical bullet. Nastiest stuff in the world. Um, all right, so where are we going with this? Um, we won't talk about it too much, but in addition to sort of a sound having a frequency, which is to say sort of how often does it repeat in a second, the sounds do have sort of other characteristics as well, and maybe we can talk about them very briefly. Um, what is it that sort of, we say that like visual things have color and shape and texture and stuff like that that distinguish one visual object from another in visual terms. And we say the same thing about sounds, like the sound doesn't just have frequency, right? There are a lot of other things that distinguish one sound from another. What are some of those characteristics? Yeah. Timbre is a difficult one. The simple ones like... Uh, loudness. Amplitude. Yeah, simple ones yeah. are things like loudness, right? So... Loudness, rhythm. We throw that away. Well, rhythm isn't inherent to a sound itself, really. So we have low frequency sound here, right? And uh, let's try to put this display back up so it's a little larger. Okay, and so uh, we can simply make it smaller. Oops, wrong place to sense that. Hold on. There we go. Right, so we can make it larger, and we can make it smaller. And we can make it so small that it's basically no excursion at all, and it doesn't actually vibrate the air. And that's something we take for granted, but loudness is a big part of the sound. So we have uh, frequency, we'll just call that F. We have uh, loudness of the sound, which we call... Uh, Amplitude, which is to say like tallness or height or something like that. We can simply measure that from top to bottom on the screen and that's a uh, description of how big, how much of a sound there is. Uh, and then in addition we have what are some of the other ones. Probably the most important thing about a sound is that the best thing about a sound is when the sound is over. Right, sounds like this. Last forever, right? I can turn this thing on, and as long as this building is supplied by electricity, I'm making my music, right? 
<laughs> so I can delay the concert and go, well, Lamont Young did a lot of stuff like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> permanent sounds, well, your thing is pretty much permanent yeah. music too, right? Except this, there well, it's It's limited, but it's very long. Right, on a cross-sectional <laughs> basis, it does stop. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the best things about a sound is when it's over. So a sound, if we call this time and this, uh, let's call this loudness or something like that, like a sound that sort of starts and stops is a good one, right? A sound has some sort of a characteristic in time when it begins and ends. So if we put uh, frequency, amplitude, and loudness together, we can start to do thing, uh, frequency, amplitude, and uh, duration together. Say duration. We start to do sort of more complex things, like we can change the loudness over time, which is something that most sounds do. Most sounds don't just go like this. Right? Sort of start at full loudness and end completely abruptly, right? That's the sort of shape of this sound. It goes on, off. Right? But most sort of natural sounds, which are a hell of a lot more interesting than acoustic, uh, electronic sounds, have uh, uh, more complicated shapes, right? Like the sound goes like this. Right? Well, I changed its frequency, which is a shame, but it sort of starts really, goes. Right, so it starts really abruptly and then it sort of gradually changes, <coughs> uh, reduces in time. So we call a change in amplitude over time, right, because that's what real sounds do. Uh, we call that the envelope of the sound, right, because uh, it's sort of uh, how we wrap the sound. If we, if we were to put the sound in an envelope, that would be sort of the shape of the envelope in order to hold the sound or something like that. We sort of envelop it. That's where the term comes from. Where else does it come from, smart guy? I just never heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Great. that's, that's my best explanation. That's um, okay, and so that's a big big thing with sounds, right? Not just turning it on and off, but also shaping it in time. Uh, shaping its amplitude in time is a big one. And then finally, the sound just doesn't have very simple sort of components like boring old sine waves. I mean, Right? This is a very sort of thin, measly sound, right? There's not a lot of stuff to it. It's a hell of a lot different from a sound like um, like this one, for instance, which has a lot more m muscle to it. For your debt-free Bible, call 1-800-400-8427. Right? That's a sound with some real stuff in it, right? So a sound doesn't just go, a sound doesn't have this sort of very simple cross-sectional sort of bland geometric quality, but a sound actually doesn't just have single frequencies in it, a sound has multiple frequencies at the same time. <coughs> There's an awful lot of component frequencies sort of all mixed together in a sound that change very rapidly over time. They get louder, they get quieter, all these sort of very complicated components to a sound that change in time. That's what really makes a sound very distinguishable from another, right? So like, uh, who are the best singers in this group? Raise your hand. Carlos. <laughs> uh, like, I just want like two people to hold uh, hold, hold the same note, where one person goes ah, and another person holds the same note. Right. So you're basically playing the same pitch at a similar amplitude, and yet we're able to tell one person's voice from another. Right. So Susie, you're on. I'm not doing it. Okay, you're on. Ah. All right. Now Michael Nee. Ah. Right. So if you guys stand up, come to the front of the room. Everybody, <laughs> shake your hands. You're on the prices, right? Don't worry. Everybody else, sh sh uh, shut your eyes. All right, and uh, that concludes you, Susie. You're not above the law. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to point to one, and you have to t say if it's the guy in the blue shirt or the guy in the sweater. Okay, so uh, here comes the first voice. Ba. Here, here comes the second voice. Ba. Wait, I didn't point. Oh, sorry. All right, here comes the here comes the second voice. Ah! Uh, sweater. Sweater. No, it was me. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was trick. <laughs> 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 
But the point is that you can tell one voice from another very clearly simply by the characteristics of the voice that are very distinct to that voice. It has to do with, you guys can sit down, I think you, you were very good. Um, it has to do with the sort of uh, unique characteristics of one sound versus another. It's the reason we can tell the sound of a violin from the sound of a cello that's playing exactly the same pitch. Because they actually have different frequency information in there. They have different characteristics. A trumpet does sound different from a violin, even if they're playing the same note. Right? Isn't that sort of obvious? And that's an important 